So Mark chapter 8, that's what we're looking at today, our second week in the series. So last week we looked at the call of Jesus, and this week we look at the cross of Jesus. But let's pray as we come to God's Word together. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the good news of Jesus. We pray right now that you would give us really fresh hearts and minds to hear your word, to understand it, and to receive it. That as we look at Jesus, as we delight in wonder of who he is and all that he's done, that we might comprehensively and in a costly way reorientate our entire lives to him. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I wonder, as we launch into a whole new year, how do you set priorities in your life? That's the question. How do you set priorities in your life? I'm going to give you two options, and as I give you these options, you can silently assess which is more like you. So you don't need to talk about this with your neighbour, you don't have to own up to either of these, Okay, but two options. So with so many things around us that are vying for our time, our talents and our treasures, how do you decide where best and first to focus? So option A to priority setting, the thinking approach. So you know you just need a whiteboard and a marker, you're going to draw up a grid, you're going to get your quadrants on, important versus urgent, weigh up the pros and cons. Some people are excited, just as I say this, I know. And then, and only then, will you assign priorities after careful, analytical consideration. Okay, you know who you are, if that's you. It's a head sort of approach. So I can see quite a few people nodding but there's also probably a few people squirming and saying, oh, no way. I want to set priorities by how I feel from the heart. Well, that's option B. I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to authentically respond to the moment and seeing where my heart leads, and then, and only then, I will decide priorities for the year ahead. Now, Whichever may be more like you, don't be quick to judge the other. Because whether head or heart, thinking or feeling, we're all doing something that's really reflective of an individualistic type of culture in which we put ourselves at the centre of the decision-making. So in a Western individualistic type of culture, we put ourselves, we have a tendency to put ourselves in the driving seat. Our decisions of where best and first to focus become an expression of who we are, our identity. Other cultures, which may be less concerned with the individual, well, they might shape priorities around what others in your close circle think or expect, because family is an extension of who you are, of your identity. But the gospel approach is altogether different. For the Christian is to set priorities not as an expression of who they are, not as an extension of who their family may be, but in response to who Jesus is. That's totally countercultural. That we would be so convicted and compelled by who Jesus is that his priorities would radically come into and shape our lives. So that's what we're considering this January. That's what this series is all about that the conviction that Jesus is Lord of all would so shape the priorities of everything we do that even as people observe our lives, that they might see a glimpse of who Jesus is. Uh, I want you to imagine for a moment that it is a new year. You don't have to imagine that part, okay? That's actually real. It is a new year in case you're trying to keep up. But imagine as we begin the new year that every aspect of your life is brought out on a big table. So everything, nothing's off limits, all on the table. So your, your time for the year ahead, or your talents for the year ahead, all of your treasures for the year ahead. As you look at everything laid out on the table, your time, your talents, and your treasures, how will you deploy these for Jesus in 2022? That's the question. And in order to answer that question, 
we need a clear picture of Jesus. I think Mark 8 is one of the best places to go to help us with that. We have got a question, an answer, and an implication. So the question is, who do you say Jesus is? The answer is, he is the Messiah. And the implication is, take up the cross. So first, the question, who do you say that Jesus is? So would you like to look with me at verse 27 of Mark chapter 8? Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? So as things are coming into focus in Mark, there is one question on Jesus' mind. He has a singular focus. Who do people say I am? So Jesus is not asking this question because he's insecure. He's not hanging on every opinion of the public. He's asking this question because it's the question that matters to us. For anyone else, just imagine, this would be a super weird question to ask. So can you imagine for a moment that if this week at our staff meeting here at St. Bart's, I say, great, we all sit down, I say, great, we've got the agenda, but let's just put that aside for a moment because I've got one critical question to ask. Who do people say I am? Now, I might only expect some really awkward looks around the room and maybe some people sliding under the table trying to avoid any eye contact, but I also might expect the response, Adam, no one is even talking about you. Why would they be? But it seems that everyone has been talking about Jesus. And it's no wonder. He's been teaching, healing, forgiving, evicting evil, feeding thousands. Who is this guy? And when it comes to the question of who he is, well, there is no shortage of ideas. The disciples give really the most polite answers of all. So they're saying John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. But elsewhere in the Gospels, we read that people thought Jesus was just an upstart son of a carpenter. Others thought he was mad. Some even thought that he was evil. Who do people say that I am? I think it's kind of brilliant that Jesus first asked the disciples what other people are saying. Because when you ask what other people are saying, it's a really non-threatening approach. It's really simple just to relay the opinion of others, really happy to tell you what other people are thinking. Because when you answer that way, it doesn't really cost you anything. Did you note that when Jesus asked that first question, that they are all responding? They're happy to report the confusion circulating in the public. But then Jesus does something altogether surprising. He takes the public question and he makes it personal. Verse 29. But what about you? Who do you say I am? So this is a move from public opinion to personal conviction. You have to wonder that if this really caught the disciples off guard in the moment. They weren't expecting him to to pivot in this way. They all answered the previous question. Only Peter responds this time. Because whilst it's easy to answer what other people think, now all of a sudden, the disciples have to put their own answer on the line. They have to own it for themselves. Everything that Jesus has been doing and saying has been pointing to who he is. But to the answer to the question, well, that makes it personal. It's like Jesus saying to the disciples, guys, it's time to stop worrying about what everyone else thinks, and now it's time to make a decision for yourselves. Who do you say that I am? And of course, this isn't just a question for the disciples, but it's a question for us. In fact, I'm convinced that this is the most important question for all of humanity. Uh, If you're not a follower of Jesus, I would so love to encourage you that that one of your priorities for this year would be to ask this question, 
to take a closer look. It's easy to sort of come to Jesus with all sorts of assumptions. It's simple to relay everyone else's opinion, everyone else's ideas. But this is not just a question for history, but it's a question for you personally. That's why Mark has included it in the Gospel. You can try to dodge it, never really considering what you think. You could try to deflect it, always referring to the opinions of others. You can even try to delay it, to continually put it off. Or this year, you could answer it for yourself. Jesus is asking you, who do you say I am? That's the question. Second, the answer, verse 29. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. It's really important to know that when you hear the titles used for Jesus, when you hear him called Messiah or Christ, the, the same concept, so Messiah comes from the, the Hebrew and, and Christ comes from the Greek, they, they mean the same thing. It, it means the anointed one. This is the king to end all kings who will finally put things right. And so like, hooray, Peter has got it. Well, at least he's sort of got it. And Jesus, in the first instance, you know, he doesn't dismiss Peter's declaration that he is the Messiah, because it's true. And so this isn't just Jesus announcing that the kingdom of God has drawn near, has come near, but that he, well, he's the king. So Peter seems to get it, but there is a problem. Peter understands that Jesus is the king, but he doesn't really understand what that's going to involve. He's got very different ideas to Jesus. It's important to understand that whilst not all Jews wanted or expected a Messiah, those who did generally had three expectations of that Messiah. And so Tom Wright summarizes three, three expectations, and he says the expectations were first that he would rebuild or cleanse the temple, second that he had to defeat an enemy, the enemy that was threatening God's people, but also third, that he had to bring God's justice to Israel and the world. And so likely that's what Peter is expecting of Jesus, that, that Jesus is going to march up to Jerusalem, defeat evil, overturn injustice, and take up the throne. But as quickly as Peter makes the declaration that Jesus is the king, Jesus connects his kingship with the cross. So verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, and so Jesus is referring to himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. This would have been so shocking for the disciples to hear. So Son of Man is, is Jesus' favourite way of referring to himself. It means human, but it means so much more. And so it's a reference to Daniel chapter 7, but it's also an allusion to Zechariah, in which someone like a son of man, so a divine figure with heavenly hosts would arrive. And we read in Daniel that this person was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so Jesus is taking that prophecy, but he's also combining it with the mysterious suffering servant that we read about in Isaiah, and he's seeing the two as one. And Jesus is saying to Peter, I am the king, but not the king you're expecting. I've come not to live, but to die. Not to rule, but to serve. I don't have a throne, but a cross. The idea that Jesus, that this great teacher that the Messiah would be crucified, would have been absolutely shocking. That would be the, the ultimate loss against the empire rather than a victory. That's why when hearing this news of suffering, Peter immediately pulls Jesus aside. So imagine this, the one he's just heralded to be the Messiah, Peter pulls him aside and he rebukes Jesus. Jesus, you are totally off message. You are totally off track. The word for rebuke that's used here to describe what Peter does 
is, is the strongest possible language. It's, it's the same language that Jesus uses with demons. But as plainly as Peter rebukes Jesus, Jesus sets him straight. Verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, whilst you may not understand yet while I must die, your attempt to dissuade me from suffering and death is actually an evil deviation. It would be from God's will. Peter wants a, a crossless view of Jesus. He, he can't fathom how the cross would be necessary. But Jesus sees clearly that the cross and the king must go hand in hand. The Son of Man must suffer and must be killed. The verb for must that's used expresses necessity, in fact, even divine necessity. So you can kind of think of it from a legal but also a cosmic perspective. So legally, Jesus must die to, to pay the cost of sin and evil. Whenever someone does something wrong by you, say someone steals something from you, you, you have the choice to either absorb the cost or demand payment from the thief. If you choose to forgive, when you choose to absorb the cost, then that will involve some suffering. Same if someone robbed you of reputation or something else. Forgiveness always involves some suffering. What we see on a much bigger scale with sin, Jesus in effect is saying, either you can pay the penalty for sin or I will take it on myself. The only way we can be forgiven and live is if Jesus takes it on himself on the cross. He dies the death we deserve so that we don't have to. But there's also a cosmic dimension to the cross. In order for Jesus to establish the kingdom of God, it was only through the cross that he could break the power of death and evil. And so his death becomes the death of death. And his resurrection becomes the beginning of God's new world. Which means, according to Jesus, the implication is that all who follow him must also take up the cross. So verse 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus, of course, not being uh, against pleasure, he's not seeking pain either, He's also not using cross-bearing as some sort of weak metaphor to describe the experience of carrying some burden through life. Remember the context. People carrying crosses were those who were going to execution. And so you carried your cross to the place of execution in order to signify submission to Rome's power. That's why Rome used crucifixion, one of the reasons they did. And so Jesus is using this image to make his point of to whom his followers submit. Cross-bearing as a follower of Jesus means nothing less than giving up one's whole life over to him. Everything. If you have a, a crossless view of Jesus, that the cross was unnecessary, then the cost will absolutely seem too high. We will want to avoid suffering at all cost. We want to put down the cross for an easier ride. But Jesus says that would not be to have the mind of God. But when you ask the question of who Jesus is, rejoice in the answer that this king has a cross, only one thing remains that we would lay down our lives for him a costly and comprehensive reorientation of our lives. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who, during World War II, was hanged by the Nazis for his resistance against that evil empire, 
wrote, the cross is laid on every Christian. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Now, that might absolutely seem like losing our lives, yet Jesus says it's actually the beginning of life. Verse 35, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? This can seem like a, a bit of a paradox that losing a life is gain. The, the word life in the original language, it means our whole identity and personality. And what we're seeing that is that as Jesus' true identity is being revealed, we discover that our true identity is found in him. So our identity is not, not based on what you've achieved or what you've accumulated or how good you've been, of how many tasks that you complete this year, of how well you do on the share market this year, of what promotion or performance re review you receive, of the degree you finish, of the experiences you manage to rack up despite all the travel restrictions, or how many followers you gain on social media. No. With God, our value and our identity, receiving his love and forgiveness, has nothing to do with our doing and everything to do with what God has done. Uh, this is the most liberating news to begin the new year. That when we put, our, put Jesus at the centre of our lives, because it's in him we find our ultimate value, worth and reward, we're free to throw off all the expectations of ourselves and others and embrace what's best and first according to the priorities of Jesus, of how we're using our time, talents and treasures for Jesus. So the question to really consider this is, do the ways we deploy these things reflect our priorities or the priorities of our Lord? Will that involve cost? Of course. Why would we expect anything else? But in him, how great is the reward? C.S. Lewis put it like this, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favourite wishes every day and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fibre of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will really be yours. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin and decay. But look for Christ... And you will find him, and with him, everything else thrown in. Uh, this year, as you focus on what's best and first, ask the question, hear the answer, embrace the cross. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray and ask you, please, in your kindness and the power of your spirit, that you would help us to see so clearly who Jesus is of all that is done, and that we would revel in wonder and delight in that good news. Lord, we pray that you would help us in every way to embrace the cross. Lord, please help us as we seek to follow Jesus, to, to radically and comprehensively reorientate every aspect of our lives to you. Lord, we particularly pray now that you would really convict us of the way in which we use our time, our talents, and our treasures on every one of our front lines, that the priorities we set would be according to what's first and best for your son. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege of following Jesus. And I particularly pray today for anyone who has not yet considered that question for themselves of who do you say that Jesus is? So please help them to really consider that question and please also help them to see clearly the truth of who Jesus is. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.